So what I thought to talk a bit about today was yeah, who we are, Jesuit Social Services, our history and the work that we do in this space, um, what we know and how we know what we know, um, and then also a little bit about community perceptions around uh, how we gather information around the, you know, what happens for the, in the lives of these young peoples and this offending that we've seen. Um, talk a little bit about the circumstances around the last year where we've seen some really significant challenges in the criminal justice system, specifically for young people. And then talk a little bit about a vision and a purpose for this work, uh, something that we think is the, is the you know, clear starting point for anything that you do in this space. So firstly, to Jesuit Social Services, we're a social change organisation. Um, we've been around for about 40 years, well, in fact, 40 years this year. Um, our vision is around building a just society. I've got to remember to do that. Um, and we have three values that guide, shape and inform our work around welcoming, discerning and courageous. Uh, and I can't um, emphasise enough just how important and critical those values are to the work we do across all of the different areas uh, that we work in. We work in four key areas, the, so the area that I'll talk about today around uh, justice, and that's really been our history um, for, as I said, for 40 years. Um, but we also work in the area of mental health uh, and with, with individuals with really complex needs and, uh, and, and uh, health issues. And then we work in, in settlement and community building. Again, we've been doing that for uh, over 20 years, um, working with newly arrived communities and supporting them to uh, you know, integrate into their communities of choice. And the other area that we... Oh, what's happened there? The other area that we work in is in relation to um, uh, education and training. And, and it's probably fair to say that that lens around education and training is something we apply equally to all of the programs that we work across. Um, fundamentally, we believe that a, a good education and employment is the best pathway out of poverty. So talk, thinking about what we know, often um, one of the challenges we face is that um, criminal justice sells newspapers. And if you think about the headlines that you would have seen, these wouldn't be unfamiliar to you. You know, gang brawls in Melbourne, Melbourne teen gang leaving trail of violence, uh, violent youth crime on the rise, half Parkville youth detention closed because of rioting. Um, they're highly emotive. Um, and we feel they don't always actually tell the full picture. If you think about the imagery, again, uh, very good at selling papers, good for ratings, um, and sometimes helps win votes uh, subject to your political ideology, but again, not always telling the full picture. These were some of the most recent images that you would have seen on, on the news and on the media in relation to young people and children, in this instance, writing in Parkville. Um, and again, it doesn't paint the, the picture, tell the story of what's happening in the lives of those children. So hopefully today we can unpack a little bit more around that. So what we would say is that despite some of the media coverage, there's only really a very small percentage of young people who come to the attention of the law, enforcement, and fewer still that require formal court intervention. In fact, um, the numbers of young people being sentenced in the children court have dropped dramatically over the last five, ten years. Um, down uh, 42% uh, from 2010. Uh, the vast majority who engage in criminal offending don't constitute a risk to community safety. Um, however, as you would have observed over the last year through the media, there is a small group of persistent, high-profile, high-risk offenders, um, young people, um, where there are some really serious challenges. Again, from our perspective, that sort of offending requires a very careful, thoughtful response, and not a response that's best drawn from uh, highly emotive media content that sometimes that won't always contribute to good policy making. So, probably good to start with um, an image like this, which comes from the Sentencing Advisory Council, and it. Um, it just highlights the number of young people of the age of criminal responsibility in Victoria. So there's about 550,000 children in Victoria. Sadly, the age of criminal responsibility starts at 10. International evidence would suggest that's way too low. Um, in some countries, some European, Scandinavian countries, the age of criminal responsibility doesn't start till 14. Fundamentally, what that means is you're not providing a, a, a criminal justice response to the needs of children. So we would argue that 
um, that age of 10 is too young. Um, but then if you look at what happens to those 550,000, there's only about 7,500 of them who have contact with the police and are processed by the police. And of that 7,500, 3,500 go on to have no further contact. But 3,500 do have ongoing contact with the criminal justice system. But in the context of 550,000, that's a relatively small number. That's a number that we believe you can work with but you need to have evidence-based, careful, thoughtful, uh, purposeful approach to doing that work. So in that detention, the last part of the triangle there, you'll see there's 103 people um, on, that were sentenced in that in 15-16 to, to a period of detention in, in one of the, the, the two youth justice centres, Parkville or Malmesbury. Um, what that probably doesn't illustrate quite as effectively is the numbers of young people that have been churning through the criminal, uh, through the youth justice centres over the last uh, 18 months, two years. And those numbers have gone up for a range of reasons, not, re not least of which has been changes to legislation, which saw a breach of an order um, result back in detain, uh, being detained. And, and that poses a real challenge. So about 10 years ago, that 103 would have been the majority of young people in in custody, and they were all sentenced. So, and they would have represented about 80% of the, the population in youth justice centres, and there would have been another 20% that were on remand or remandees. That's changed and changed quite dramatically. So we now have a situation where we have about 80% for a range of reasons who are on remand and only 20%, which means that young people are coming into custody for a relatively short period of time and it's very difficult to then do that purposeful, intentional work with them. This is probably, I think, the most important slide of this presentation, and I think that's something that gets lost and certainly something that doesn't get the sort of media focus that we think is important. It's an annual snapshot taken by the Youth Parole Board in relation to the characteristics of the young people who go into detention. And as you can see, those stats are quite um, damning. 71% of the young people who go into custody have experienced abuse, torture or trauma. 56% uh, of them have been expelled or suspended from school and the vast majority would have been uh, disengaged from formal learning or education, um, something that's clearly a significant worry in the context of finding and re-engaging with purposeful training when they come out. 40% um, of these young people have mental health issues. 65% have a history of substance misuse, often starting at a relatively young age. 9% um, were parents. So that means that unless we do something with them in relation to parenting and in relation to the, the, the what good parenting looks like and work really intensively, we're just creating the next generation and we'll see the next generation of young people come through the criminal justice system. So again, these aren't the stats that the media um, or the politicians like to talk to, or, um, but we feel are important. Um, oh, sorry, I, I didn't have it up there. Oh, did I? Um, uh, sorry. This is what the media like to show. So there's a clear contrast, isn't there? One is, you know, will elicit a really emotive response and often a response of anger, where the other response that you'll get from when you really look at the detail and the nature and characteristics of the young people that we're working with, you get a real sense of the disadvantage that they've experienced over a long period of time. Uh, actually, I'll just go back. Um, so, the other one that I'd really highlight here is 13% of these children were homeless before they came into custody. So I don't have to spell that out, I guess, for you. In the context of finding, having a meaningful life, engaging with the community, engaging with purposeful activity during the days, is particularly difficult if you don't have a safe, stable home to live in. Um, so fundamentally, part of the work that we do is supporting people to access housing and to sustain that housing. When you think about youth detention, I just want to t briefly touch on this. Um, you cannot think about young people in detention without thinking of the shameful incarceration rates of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, this graph just briefly illustrates those numbers on a, on a daily basis across the country. As you can see, in the Northern Territory, 96% of young people incarcerated are of Aboriginal um, <coughs> descent origin. 
So we are incarcerating the first peoples of this country at a rate second to none. Perhaps America would be the only one with this sort of shameful history. Um, but it's a call for us to do something about. Um, it's a call to action. You can, I mean, you can also see there are variations across the country, variations around ages. In Queensland, shamefully again, um, the age of criminal responsibility for children is around 10 to 70, so they're locking 18-year-olds up in a prison, um, in adult prisons. Um, prisons do irreparable damage um, to the well-being of children. Many of these people, going back to those stats, uh, some of them have an intellectual disability, many of them have lower level cognitive functioning. Coming from a, a background of abuse means that they are heightened anyway uh, in, in their responses. So instead of a consistent, careful approach, we're putting them in environments which are physically dangerous for them. So thinking about youth offending and what's been happening, there have been changes, but first and foremost, the numbers of young offenders and uh, the rate across the country has dropped by 25%. In Victoria, 42% since 2008-2009. So when you see that imagery used by certain papers around youth crime on the rise, that's just not accurate. Um, so I would encourage you in the conversations you have with family and within your communities, interrogate that data that they use. Um, just some, some basic data, the predominant uh, offending is around theft by young people, um, and there's been a drop in some offending, but a rise, which is increasingly very worryingly, around uh, offending with um, drug offences. So back to those characteristics we sp I spoke about earlier on, if you look at the Youth Parole Road Board data, 65% um, around that mark um, do their offending under the influence of drugs or alcohol. There is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, a concerning trend in relation to some of the very serious offending um, you would have seen around uh, offences such as aggravated burglary or um, motor vehicle offending. Um, and we'll talk a bit more to that. Victoria Police have highlighted that uh, the impact of things like social media um, and uh, they've, they've noted that move away from sort of opportunistic offending, which was very much something that we were very familiar with, with, with children and young people, to a more planned stage. Um, in that space, again, we would not underestimate the impact of uh, adult criminal elements that uh, can easily lead children astray. Again, um, a significant worry is the overrepresentation of people from uh, culturally and linguistically diverse groups. Um, the Maori Pacifica Islanders uh, who we see um, in detention and on youth justice orders and increasingly worrying the numbers from East Africa and, and particularly from South Sudan. What, what we don't hear about when we hear about the violent crime and the offending is we don't hear about the trauma, the poverty, the racism and the exclusion that these children have experienced on a daily basis. We don't hear about the failure of some settlement programs to really actually engage with these children. We don't hear about the failure sometimes within the school setting um, where children, uh, as back to that stat again, 56% of kids uh, expelled or suspended from school. We don't hear about the fact that the majority of these children come from what we would call postcodes of disadvantage. So these are the factors that really help inform and build a picture around what it is we need to be doing in this space. There have, uh, the, the, what the other thing that I, you know, we would say about this is it needs a whole of community response. Uh, I keep coming back to education because education is a key protective factor in the lives of children and young people. We all know that from our own <coughs> families. Um, we have to do everything we can to keep kids in school. One of the programs that we deliver in the Hugh Moreland region, Navigator, um, doesn't necessarily work with kids who intersect the criminal justice system, but it works with kids who've been attending school less than 30% of the time. Many of these children, as young as 12, 13, 14, have not been to school for two or three terms. But unfortunately, there's a gulf between the school and between the family and the community. Um, so what we do in that space, all of our work, whether it's with children, young people, adults, is based around assertive outreach. So it really means going out looking for people, working with them, engaging with them and unpacking for the, with them what's happening for them in their, in their family life and in their community. Um, so 
we do everything we can to keep the child in school because while they may not be, um, in, you know, having contact with the police, which is the first port of call around the criminal justice system, there's often a very high chance they will if they're not engaged in purposeful activity during the day. Look, we're very confident um, in what we know and what we do and our approach. And I'll just talk to this slide very briefly, um, which is, um, the, if you like, the, what, what informs and guides our practice framework and how we engage with, with children, families and young people. And fundamentally, it's about affirming you know, that young person and their identity. It's about building hope and aspiration and without failure and listening to the voices of young people. And these young people have a voice. They're often not shy to share it with you if you've got the time and make the space to listen to what they have to say. Um, recently, over the last year, um, independently of those rights and prior to that, the government initiated a review into youth justice, which was long overdue um, from our perspective and, and conducted by two um, you know, very well um, uh, you know, knowledgeable uh, individuals, Professor James Ogoloff um, and Penny Armitage. As part of that review, we obviously met with them on a number of occasions and shared with them our practice. Um, one of the issues that we spoke about or one of, uh, was the, the number of assaults that were happening in a custodial setting, setting, something that we absolutely do not condone in any way and we acknowledge the challenges about working in a custodial setting. But as we highlighted, we work with exactly those same young people um, they were having critical incidents on a weekly basis, really serious assaults on staff. Um, we work with exactly those same young people. I've been working for Jesuit Social Services in this, you know, working in this area for the last seven years. There's not been one assault on any of our staff in that period of time. To the best of my knowledge, there have been no assaults on any of our staff in 10 years. Um, because at the heart of what we do is build a relationship with that young person. And a relationship, a trusting relationship, is a critical component to then planning for purposeful work with that young person when they transition back in a community. If you have a population of young people, mainly on remand, not knowing how long they're going to be in custody, disconnected from family, disconnected from community, um, moved around, then of course they're going to get angry and upset. If you then also have a, a staff, um, you know, a workforce, who aren't perhaps as uh, skilled as they need to be, this is complex work. I mean, if you look at those characteristics of the young person, this requires really skilled professionals stepping into this space and working and engaging with them. If you have an environment where people don't feel safe, then you're going to get large, significant amounts of staff turnover, turnover and you won't have those skills there to call on. So our practice framework is critical for us in shaping, along with the values and the mission and vision of the organisation, of shaping how we engage with really vulnerable young people. But that said, despite our confidence in, in what we know and, and the years that we've had building up that body of knowledge, um, when, uh, you know, at the point where we were really in some serious trouble and there was a move of youth justice from the Department of Health and Human Services into and under the umbrella of the Department of Department of Justice and Regulation, we decided we really wanted to investigate further what's happening in other nations and in other countries in relation to how they engage and work with young people who, who come in contact with the criminal justice system. So senior members of our executive, including the chair of our board, Patricia Faulkner, our CEO, Julie Edwards, embarked on a study tour um, in two different directions. Um, one in Northern America, where Ironically, I think in, in North America you've got some of the best practice and some of the worst practice, and there's really good literature around that. Um, and we certainly learned a lot more there. And then um, another group, Julian and Sally, our um, executive director programs, went to Europe and had a look at some services there. So in Europe, you know, Germany, Norway, the United Kingdom, and Spain, and, and in America, um, Washington, Missouri, New York, and Seattle. And, and what we observed and learned um, very much resonated with what we already know, but clearly there were some very uh, there were some very clear messages that came out about creating and keeping communities safe, um, and about young people at risk of incarcerated and socialising, re-socialising those in detention. So it was really about investing in this work, 
Um, sadly, um, both sides of government over the years have probably ignored what we've had brewing away in, in Victoria. And we had uh, in Victoria 10 years ago really um, the best youth justice system in the country. Um, arguably one of the best youth justice systems in the world. We, we pioneered the dual track system which saw vulnerable 18 to 21 year olds uh, not incarcerated in the adult prison. We pioneered diversion and doing everything about keeping young people away from the criminal justice system. Um, and we had actually bipartisan support. Sadly, we've lost that because criminal justice is a great vote winner. Um, so sadly, we've lost our focus and lost our way a little bit over the last 12, 18 months, um, longer um, perhaps, um, around what we do to really create safe communities. Um, and not only create safe communities, uh, use our, our tax dollars most effectively. One of the messages was something that we know, we know very well, which is that incarceration is harmful. Um, it does more harm than good and should only be used as a last resort. We're, we're not saying abolish prisons or youth justice centres. Uh, there's no question that there are some people, who, a hardened few of even young people, who need to be incarcerated. But that should be the punishment. The punishment is that you go to prison. Then we begin our work with you around rehabilitation. The challenge is we've, we've lost sight of that a little bit. So basically we've lost our way around rehabilitation and the end game really around community. Because everyone comes out, even in the adult justice prisons, the average time of uh, someone's in prison is about uh, 12, 18 months. So they come, people come back into communities. How we support them make that really challenging transition from custody to community is a critical component. But the message overwhelming over, from overseas was incarceration as a last resort. Um, keep young people, as I've, as I've mentioned already, engaged with education, engaged with their families and at home, and work with them in those environments. That doesn't mean you, you ignore them and leave them alone. It doesn't mean they don't have to face the consequences of their offending. Uh, that's something that we take very seriously. We believe every young person has to understand what the impact of the offending uh, has on individuals, on other families and on community, which is why we're such strong advocates for restorative practice. Um, what else did we learn? Um, again, really reinforced a lot of what we know and a lot about practice, but thorough, careful assessments, really work with the individual to get a sense of what's happening for them. Um, address the criminogenic behaviours. Again, one of the most effective ways we'd say about doing that is about using restorative practice, um, which we deliver 120 group conferences every year. Um, we have the traction of the legislation in the 2005 Children's Act, and that brings young people together in a circle with the victims of their crime and anybody who's been affected by the crime. Unlike a courtroom, which for many young people that we work with is an intimidating kind of strange environment where they don't actually even have, get to have a voice, um, in, a, in a group conference the young person comes face to face with their offending and the impact of that. Um, it is not a soft option, it is an extremely challenging option for a young person to hear from the victim of their crime about the impact of the crime. And it's really quite simple, it really works from the principles of, well, do no harm, um, working with somebody rather than to or for them, um, and then establishing the right relationships. Um, what happens in a group conference very simply is everybody gets their opportunity to talk about what happened. You then get the opportunity to, to hear from everybody about how that affected you, and then you look at what are we going to do to make things better. So it's completely unlike an adversarial approach. It's really a, a collaborative approach where everybody comes together um, with that young person to ensure that they understand the impact of their offending and to look at ways that they can actually redress the harm. On, on, the, on the topic of staffing that I was talking about and some of the real challenges um, that we've experienced in custodial centres, um, this was interesting, this was new for me, the concept of dynamic security. So this is security based upon the relationship I have with a young person. 
So I don't need a baton, I don't need spray, I don't need to be six foot five and full of muscle. I need a relationship with a young person where I build trust and I build respect. And that's what's effective with young people. And that's what we know in community. That's why we've had no critical incidents or assaults on our staff, because they work from that premise around building a relationship. One of the challenges, and we need to think about that, around appropriate resourcing for our youth justice centres in the context of staffing, because you need to have really qualified, skilled staff in those spaces. Um, if you think you cast your mind back to what we saw in Four Corners in relation to Dondale and the incarceration of Aboriginal young people there and the shocking and horrific abuses there that led to the Royal Commission, um, we didn't have that sort of dynamic security in place. We had an, an institution that left itself open to abuse. Um, what they said in Norway is the best guarantee against ill treatment and torture is highly qualified, skilled staff, and we would agree. Now, th this horse has bolted a little bit because we're about to build a, a, a big, new 250-odd bed facility for you know, youth justice facility in Cherry Creek, uh, near Werribee. Um, something, arguably, that we, we would have seen not as the preferred way to go. That said, we're working with government and we know that government is looking at design carefully and, and there's opportunities for services like our own to have input into that. But the evidence would suggest that that's not the best way to incarcerate young people or children. The most effective way is small groups uh, in um, home-like residential units and ideally in their communities. Um, so. Um, not the large supermax um, type prisons that we've been hearing about. The, the problem we have with prisons, um, and as I indicated, don't get me wrong, there are some people who need to be in prison, um, but the problem we have with prisons, particularly with young people and children, is that if you create prisons, you'll create prison-like behaviours. It's, it's a clear correlation, and we see that now with the secure setting that's been in place for a while at Malmesbury, you have young people who then toughen up and harden up. So it's increasingly harder then to build that relationship and break down those levels and build that trust. Um, don't demonise young people. They're children. Their brains aren't fully developed. They've experienced trauma. Um, we need to actually respect and listen to young people and not uh, demonise them, as we've seen done in the, in the media and the tabloids particularly. Um, and you need to invest in long-term strategies. Um, it won't go away. We've had uh, young people committing crime uh, since the days of Aristotle. You know, it, this, this will, it's not going away. It's around what a purposeful approach looks like in that space. Uh, so, so we would argue you need a vision. You need a vision and you need a clear purpose. And we've lost a little bit of that, I think, in those statutory environments. Um, but they've also had particular challenges, large case numbers. Uh, and if you're constantly putting fires out, it's very difficult to sit down and do careful, thoughtful planning. But as I indicated, um, that heightened environment that, that elicits an angry, emotive response is not conducive to good policy making. So we would argue that a youth justice system that enables young people who offend or are at risk of offending to lead healthy, productive and crime-free lives has got to be the starting point for your vision. That's where we go, because as I indicated, they will come back in the community. So we want to create safe communities, so we have to engage and work with them. And the purpose has to be about rehabilitation. As I indicated, the punishment is being incarcerated. That's the punishment. Punishment's done, now let's look at what's going to be different. How are we going to address your criminogenic behaviours? How are we going to support you around your mental health issues? How are we going to ensure that you have a safe home to come out to when you, when you transition out? How are we going to work with your family? How are we going to support you about your parenting skills to address your substance misuse? Careful, thoughtful, methodical planning. So, again, what do we need? We need relationship-based models. The evidence is, is clear. Relationships are what work. Building relationships are trust. We need to intervene earlier and, 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 and deeper. Um, diversion, you know, Victoria has a really proud record in the history of diverting young people away from the criminal justice system. We need to reinvest in that. Um, we need to listen to the voices of young people. Um, we need to developmentally appropriate approaches. We need to recognise the importance of culture. 
that's a, that's a critical component that sadly um, we've, I think, often only been tokenistic in our approach. Um, we cannot underestimate the importance of culture, connection to country for Koori people in Victoria, Koori kids and families. Um, that connection to family is critical and community. Again, I've spoken about assessment, but we need to address the offending. Again, the, the most effective way that we know about uh, to do that is through restorative practice. That's not the silver bullet. That's a component of, a, of, a, of an approach that alongside therapeutic counselling, alongside case management, alongside engaging children and young people back into education and learning pathways, these are the components that make up the sort of careful work that will support young people to break patterns of recidivism. We have to address the mental health and wellbeing of these kids. As I said, some of these children are you know, starting out with illicit and illicit substances as early as you know, 10 or 11. Um, a piece of research we did way back in 2010 around um, young Koori kids uh, indicated that if you're between the age of 10 and 14, if you are using substances, if you come in contact with the criminal justice system, then you're going to penetrate further into that criminal justice system. So we know, intervene early. Intervene early and work with family. Um, restorative justice, I've spoken about a coordinated approach. It's not that Victoria has lost its way completely. There are some really good elements of the work that we do, um, both from a statutory perspective, in custody and in community. But often they're not coordinated, and that's what happens when pressures, you know, systems come under pressure. If you don't have a coordinated response, a careful, planned response to the needs of a young person that recognises them as an individual and listens to them, then you will have ad hoc responses that aren't joined up, often linked to misconceived ideas sometimes about risk uh, or a, you know, um, alignment with, a, with an order that a young person might be on. But once that order finishes, then services are gone. The, the sort of issues that, the, as one of my colleagues said, who, who looks after our one of our youth justice programs, we, we'd, we'd been working this kid for 12, 18 months, and I said, so, you know, just refresh for me, what's our purposeful, intentional work look like? And he goes, a lot of this is we're just building the trust. He said, you don't overcome these 14 years that this child's experienced in, in you know, in three months, six months, nine months. It takes time. So. A critical point for us is a continuum of service delivery and support that can take dip in, dip out as required by the young person and their family. Strong frameworks for support and accountability. The other thing I didn't say about group work, um, group conferencing and community conferencing or family group conferencing, so we, you know we're working in a range of areas, is it holds young people accountable. At the end of the process, when that young person demonstrates that they've got that insight into the offending and the impact that that's had on others. Um, then we call for accountability. So what are we going to do to make things better? And we literally write that down. We develop a plan with a young person. I was in a group conference earlier this week with a young girl in Parkville, a pre-release conference, some really serious offending. But what a history. If you knew that young girl's history, it, it would break your hearts. Um, introduced to substances at you know, the age of 9 or 10. Sexually abused. Um, shocking. Uh, you know, experiences that would, you know, cause incredible trauma. This brave young girl is, is getting out of parole on Christmas and we had that conference. We had the police in the room, we had uh, the workers in the room, we had everybody who's going to be working with her and there was a shared commitment from that room to work with this young girl and to help her break these patterns. The other damning fact about, you know, that young girl's history was she spent so long in out-of-home care and residential care. And that's the next system, that child protection system, residential care, out of home care system that we need to look at very carefully because we've got some real challenges happening in that space and we're seeing sometimes through poor policy the criminalisation of behaviours that would not happen in any of our families. We've all experienced... The other thing I think people forget about children, and I've got four of the nasty little things myself, but, you know, the, the thing we sometimes forget is that they're growing up. Um, they will do stupid things. They, their behaviours will be out of line. It requires, you know, good authoritative parenting for kids. These kids often haven't had that. 
over 40% of the kids in detention have had some interaction with child protection or out-of-home care or easy care. Actually, I'm not sure about the out-of-home care. Don't quote me on that. Look at, look at the stats on the Youth Parole Board report. But, but fundamentally, um, those systems aren't as strong as they could be. And I'm not pointing the finger at out-of-home care providers in any way, shape or form, because that's a really challenging space to work in. Again, working with... You saw the characteristics of these kids. Challenging behaviours, challenging experiences. Um, and sadly, what happens in those environments, often the staff are relatively new or green and coming out of you know, social work or certificate you know, qualifications, and they're working with the most complex kids. We've kind of got it around the wrong way a bit. You know, these children need highly qualified, skilled practitioners um, who can, you know, take their hits, if you like, you know, metaphorically. Um, not um, people who are going to be threatened and, and by abusive language and behaviours. Because those behaviours need to come out and we need to work with them. Um, I think I've said enough about education. I can't, you know, uh, the focus of our organisation, uh, you know, in 2005, I think it is, we formed Jesuit Community College. That was really about a response to the needs of the most vulnerable, disadvantaged individuals, uh, including children who had disengaged from, from mainstream learning pathways. That's not to say we shouldn't keep a focus on mainstream schools. We need to hold schools accountable, but schools too easily... And, look, schools are an incredibly large institution... Um, and there's some unbelievably brilliant examples of what happens in schools, but there are some terrible examples. Um, and again, that's a real challenge for teachers, isn't it, to manage the behaviour in the classroom uh, of somebody who's acting up, if you want to call it that. But the moment we suspend or expel, we really put those kids at risk. So we need to work with schools to ensure that we support them to keep young people engaged in those learning environments. Incarceration as a last resort and good transition planning. planning. Um, you know, as we say, the focus of custody has got to be community. These kids are coming back into community and we want to create safe communities and we want them to understand uh, that they need to change the behaviour. You know, we do not tolerate or condone this serious offending, but we have to work with them. We can't ignore that there's something happening in those spaces. Um, so from the moment... Uh, the, the young person touches the criminal justice system, we've got to be planning and thinking um, around what sort of response is going to meet the needs of this kid and also their siblings. 35% or you know, suddenly around that mark of the kids in custody have a sibling or a parent in custody. It, it's a, you know, undeniable you know, evidence that suggests that the children of young people, uh, uh, children of parents who... who uh, have spent time in prison, uh, you know, almost double the likelihood that they will also go down that pathway. So, with, so the evidence is there. Um, we just need to act on it. Again, we don't shy away from the offending behaviour. So there are, you know, opportunities to put, you know, specific programs in place. We need to test them. We need to ensure they're evidence based. But if it's around motor vehicle offending, if there's a, you know, a modus operandi there, we need to look into that. Um, one of the programs that we deliver in, in southern Melbourne is a motocross program. Um, now, part of that really is about building a relationship of trust with a young person. As we know, some of these kids won't engage with anyone, but they like going fast. <laughs> we would prefer that they go fast in a safe, controlled environment than down the Western Ring Road doing a Snapchat at the same time. So you have to be a bit creative and innovative in this space. <coughs> the motocross program is not a... a, a an isolated vehicle to address offending and, and break patterns of recidivism. It's one component. As we you know, always say, it's, it's that suite of options that you need um, tailored to the young person that will best um, break patterns of recidivism. Look, uh, the point about remand is, is, is really clear. You, you, it's very difficult to do that intentional work in a custodial setting when you've got somebody who's not sure how long they're going to be there um, often these kids will get out and, you know, to their court hearing and, and their sentence time served, which means they've basically done their time and now they're back in community. And so that's a surprise for everyone, the young person themselves sometimes. Those kids standing on the roof of Parkville um, were angry and upset because they didn't know what the future holds. You have to do everything you can to ensure that young people understand what's happening for them. And you have to do that in a way um, that is tailored to their, uh, you know, 
un un levels of understanding and education and insight. Um, I've spoken enough about staff. Uh, I might finish up with this one. This, this is really around um, what we view as the key building blocks, enablers, if you like, for a purposeful uh, approach to this um, working with these children. You need strong leadership. You have to have people who are prepared to uh, stand up, work from an evidence base, not respond to heightened, angry community responses that aren't as well informed as you guys all now are. Um, you need evidence-based interventions. You need to actually test it, what it is you're doing. Um, as I said earlier on, I, I, I'm very confident in, in the work and our practice that we do. We're not perfect by any means. Uh, we try, um, but we're prepared to send our, you know, most senior staff members, our chair of the board, um, is keen to go, I want to know more and bring that learning and information back, not only for our own organisation, but more broadly for the whole system, the service system and people working in this space so that we have a shared understanding, a shared collaborative approach to this work. We need to invest in alternative detention. There's a range of examples, you know, across the you know um, planet, where they're thinking differently. Incarceration, uh, they're very clear, is not effective in in breaking patterns of recidivism. They're looking at different ways of doing it, um, and we should introduce targets. Targets are the best way of creating a shared accountability for both, you know, non-government providers like Jesuit Social Services and government to work together to ensure that we do break patterns of recidivism, that we do support young people to engage and live meaningful, positive, pro-social lives in our, in, in our communities. Um, and we need to have a focus on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rates of incarceration. That's shameful. We should all be deeply ashamed. And the same now, sadly, with the culturally and linguistically diverse population. I might leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.